Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association and chair of the APA New Urbanism Division, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, August 3rd, and we will be hearing the presentation, Creating and Telling Your Sustainability Story Through Data and Engagement. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that 1-800 number shown. For your content questions related to the presentation, again, type those in the questions box located to the right of your screen, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2018. Thanks to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. If you're looking down the list and you don't see your chapter or division listed, we just ask that you reach out to them and suggest that they join us. Today's webcast in particular is sponsored by the Northern New England chapter of APA, and you can learn more about what they're up to at nnecapa.org. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education, and you can check those out again by visiting our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. This webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. You can log your CM credits for attending today's webcast by heading over to planning.org and logging into your My APA account. From there, you can search for CM activities either by the title of today's webcast or the event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And like us on Facebook Planning Webcast Series to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. And we do have a slate of September and October sessions. We're just finalizing details and they'll be up on our website shortly and we'll be sure to post on Facebook when you can go and sign up. We are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. We'll also have a PDF available at the end of the session, and uh, that will be ready for download at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Okay, with that, I am going to turn it over to today's speakers, Kim Lundgren and Sarah Merchant. Uh, Kim, I am turning the controls over to you. Great, thank you, and I've unmuted, so I wanna make sure that you can hear me okay. We can hear you. Okay, and the slides are showing? They are. Great, well, thank you everybody for joining. It's nice to see so many folks. Um, Sarah and I have had the pleasure of uh, doing different versions or similar versions of this presentation, uh, both at APA National Planning Conference uh, last year, and then uh, we even talked to our Public Works colleagues at their annual conference. Um, last year as well. So uh, we're really thrilled to do it in a webinar form for you all today. And we're gonna talk about um, creating and telling your sustainability story through data and engagement. Um, I'm gonna start with a bit of an overview for folks, just kind of where we're at, trends in local government, uh, why storytelling is important, and then talk a little bit about how you can turn your data into a story. Uh, and then Sarah's gonna dive into Nashua, New Hampshire's specific example doing this. Uh, and then we should have plenty of time for questions and answers. So I will get us started with trends in local government. Uh, so for those that don't know me, uh, I actually started working in local government back in 2001. Um, I was only 15, of course, when I did that, right? <laughs> Uh, but a lot has changed since then, you know, everything from looking at the impacts of climate change to dealing with challenges like cybersecurity, and then, of course, trying to keep up with the latest social media platform. Uh, you know, the number and types of our responsibilities and the challenges we're addressing, it just continues to grow 
uh, significantly. And in true local government fashion, you know, our budgets are either staying steady or going down. We have fewer people. We're all wearing multiple hats. So there's a lot of challenges. Um, we try to address all these things and, and we're constantly evolving and trying to be better at what we're doing. We're trying to be more transparent and holding ourselves accountable to our constituents. We're working hard to ensure more equitable engagement and, and leverage technology, um, but it's hard. Uh, we're trying to make these changes, but it's also really important that our constituents are understanding all that we're doing uh, and understanding why we're doing it because there's a role for them on this pathway to a more sustainable future. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to enhance how we're engaging people in that. And so starting with transparency, uh, you know, this is our, this is kind of what we're focused on. Everybody wants to know what we're doing. We should be held accountable for how taxpayer dollars are being spent. And so we're investing in different platforms. Uh, a lot of you may have open data platforms, for example. These are fantastic for consultants like me, right? Um, they're data, it's spreadsheets. I'm showing an example of one here where it's, I mean, it's, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I love this, I'm a data person, but our general public is not necessarily going to understand everything that they're looking at here. This is, a, there's a, a value for open data platforms, but it's not necessarily getting us to the point where at the end of the day, right, we are looking for everyone to make some changes in their behavior. I know we don't always like to talk about that, but even if it's as simple as, hey, we would love for you to take your bike to work one day. We've got these great bike lanes and we've added a bike share program. We want you to use bikes instead of cars. Or, hey, we want you to get out and vote. We need you to do that. That's part of being working together and being part of that sustainable community. We all have a role to play. And so it is around that behavior change. But we know that uh, looking at data alone is not going to change things. We also try to communicate more using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and every other new platform that comes out. Um, but that's really challenging, right? I'm sure a number of you have every single department in your local government has its own Facebook page or its own Twitter handle. That's a lot to keep up with when you think about like from a private sector standpoint, we need to have like five posts a day. Uh, very few of us in local government have the resources and capacity to be pumping out that much content. And so it's a challenge. Other things that we're trying, um, equitable engagement, I would say local governments are really doing a great job of trying at least to move towards a more equitable engagement process, particularly during our planning processes. Um, I know work that KLA does with our clients, we are doing lots of things from online engagement platforms like MetroQuest, which uh, we partner with. They, they do a fantastic job of getting that interactivity so people can really feel like it's fun to engage. Uh, people don't want that typical just public meeting where someone's just talking to me the whole time and then, you know, eventually asks me a question. We want to go where people are. So we ride the bus and ask people some questions, talk to them in different ways. And I think we're doing a great job during a planning process in heading in that direction, reaching out to our target populations, maybe some of those folks who haven't been part of these planning processes in the past as much as we would like. Um, <clears throat> but the problem is we need to keep that conversation going beyond the planning process. They, our constituents want us talking to them all the time, which can be challenging. Technology is another place. Everybody wants to talk about a smart city. Um, and for anyone who knows my uh, SAS Talk with Kim podcast, there's two episodes on there with Chris Castro from the city of Orlando, really good about smart cities. And one of the challenges he notes in there is it's so easy to go after the shiny new object. But it's really important that we're thinking about, is that right for my community? If you're following a smart city's pathway, um, I encourage folks to really remember your city is smartest when we start with people as the main focus. Our human connections need to be the foundation and that we're leveraging technology to support those, not to necessarily re replace all of them. Because uh, when the power goes down and we're in an extreme event, right, we're trying to be resilient. It's that human social connection that actually keeps us going. Um, so there's a lot of things to think about there, but there are ways to leverage technology for sure that we're supplementing that ongoing in-person engagement. And that can be a challenge for folks to really um, get their head around and, and work through because I know a lot of you get probably dozens of calls a month from different firms that wanna install a new technology in your city. 
So these are important things that we're doing and we need to work on how we're doing and there's ways that we can apply these all together um, and leveraging storytelling. Um, you know, the reason we talk about storytelling, of course, this is the oldest form of communication that humans have. Um, you know, right from our cave people days, uh, we were telling stories and maybe we were drawing pictures on the walls to do that, but it was about a story. And I am not a neuroscientist and I'm not going to bore folks with the details, but ultimately what you need to understand here is that there are very specific parts of your brain that turn on through a story, particularly when that story is personal, if it triggers emotion, that's what you need. And in order for us to get to the point where we are triggering that behavior change again, whether it's to vote or, you know, ride your bike to work, that pathway is not possible. There is no pathway to change behavior if we don't turn on those pieces of the brain first. So that is why storytelling is so important. We have a, a storytelling framework uh, that's available for anybody uh, for download in our resource center on our website, uh, kimlongrenassociates.com. It's very simple. Um, and I think that's what's really important here. Yes, they, we can go into more details and get into these expensive tens of thousands of dollar contracts, but ultimately you all need to have resources at your fingertip to understand how to do this. And that's what we're gonna walk you through today and then we'll get into Sarah's example. So I should say here, these are the four steps we're gonna walk through today. And I'll start with the first one and it's setting the stage. Um, this seems so obvious, I think, but it's sometimes we forget, right? A lot of us, we spend a lot of time doing our work and we're very uh, knowledgeable in the different areas. And so uh, we sometimes forget that people don't know the acronyms that we know uh, and that simple explanations are gonna go a long way. Um, you know, the reality is that not, not everybody uh, has our educational background. Uh, we wanna speak to the entire population, the general population. So we do need to keep things at a sixth grade level. So simple explanations, um, and avoiding any technical jargon are really important. One of the examples I have up here, I do a lot of work in the greenhouse gas and energy space. We talk about a million BTU all the time. It's so easy to forget that there is no um, resident out there that has received a utility bill that comes in MMBTU units, right? They're either looking at therms of natural gas or gallons of oil, kilowatt hours of electricity. So helping them understand what this unit is because it is an important unit to compare different energy types. We wanna show data in that way, but first we need to explain what it is so that they understand. Um, and I just want to say before I go on to the next step, I do have what will be in the PDF version of this um, is I put in some little exercises, uh, which you can also pull from our storytelling guidebook, which is on our website in the resource center, but helping you figure out how to craft that story for your, you know, for whatever program or project you're trying to tell. Um, it's not in this version because we don't have time to go through them, but it will be in the PDF version as well as uh, that guidebook. So the next step in the storytelling process is knowing your audience. This is with any type of communication that you're doing. Um, we ultimately, it's great to use images, icons, any type of infographics that you have. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we do things in a sixth grade level. Half of the US cannot read a book that's written at an eighth grade level. That's a really important fact to understand and how we're communicating with folks. And also recognizing that more and more of our, our um, neighbors are not um, necessarily speaking English as their first language. And so how can we engage with those folks? But on top of that, your brain processes visuals faster. And so it's easier for people to remember things that they see in an image. Um, so thinking about your audience from that perspective and recognizing you may have an audience um, like youth, for example, that is going to be more interested in a cool infographic, whereas you know maybe this, a senior might be more interested in, in maybe a little icon with a definition next to it. So it's important to understand um, what your audience cares about. This is an example of knowing your audience. This actually comes from some of Sarah's data where uh, looking at the types of Energy Star buildings in the community. And this is a bubble graph. And you know, rather than just listing it out in pie charts saying, okay, so we've got retail stores and you can see medical and uh, et cetera here. But the idea that it's pretty interesting to know like, wow, our, it's our retail stores that are doing the most with Energy Star. Who would have guessed that? Uh, in this case, you know, they've got like Targets and Kohl's that have been uh, going out of their way to get their Energy Star. 
ratings and putting solar panels on. Providing context is another really important piece, right? So we can talk about all these great things that we're doing um, and say, you know, oh, well, we've got Nashua has, you know, I think it's 18, 18 green buildings. Well, awesome. Yes. I don't know. Is that good? We can't expect that our, our constituents understand or are aware of the basics of, you know, is that a good number? I don't even know. So the idea is, you know, can we go beyond giving a single point of data? Can we at least, if we don't have other communities information, do we at least have multiple years of data for ourselves so we can at least show if we're improving or not? Um, what we like to talk about is getting folks to, oh, my screen seems to have frozen a bit here. Um, there we go. Uh, getting folks to understand um, kind of we've got this scale of four. So if you're providing data with no context or comparison, like we have in the example here, our recycling rate is 40%. I mean, it's okay. It's better than nothing. Um, but it's it's definitely better we get to that good place if we can show a change over time, kind of a self comparison. It's great if we can then if we can al also add to that the context. So a comparison with U.S. averages or your state averages or just some other communities that you um, associate with or are similar size or location. And then of course the best way to do it is also adding in that progress report. So we've not only, you know, we have the information for you from today, from previous years, we're comparing it to others, but we've also set a goal in this area and this is where we're heading towards. That is your ideal state um, for people to really make that sense. And that's where people can get excited about it and be like, wow, we're almost there. What can I do to be a part of it? When we start turning on those pieces of the brain through the storytelling, that's when they get excited to be a part of the action which is exactly the next step in the storytelling process. Yeah, and I'm just stuck again for some reason. There we go. And so that last piece is inviting the community to be part of the solution. So if you have actually gone through the effort of putting out your data, sharing it with folks, trying to engage them, you know, is important. So why, once you've got their attention, you may as well put in a call to action. What is it you want them to do to join you towards that longer term goal of a more sustainable future? Uh, you know, in, you know, in the case of the recycling, you know, it is how, hey, understand what goes in, what's been, um, understanding when their days are, just simple things like that, make them simple action. So it's something that people can do right away. Of course, you can have other actions in there if you want to, you know, talk about trying to get people to, we'd love you to consider an electric vehicle for your next vehicle purchase. Okay, you know, that's a longer term thing. But for the most part, if you're trying to cap capture people's attention, give them something easy that they can do today. So whether it's switching out their light bulbs um, or, you know, hey, we just built this new bike path. Try it out today. Test it there. I'm not necessarily going to just jump from my car to my bike to work, but maybe if I start riding this bike trail and I see where it goes, maybe I can start taking that to, to some places. So recognizing that it's hard for people to make those quick shifts. And of course, none of us can change anyone else's behavior. They have to change it. But what we can do as a local government, leveraging the fact that local governments still are considered by the majority of Americans to be trusted sources, more so than other levels of government at this point, uh, if our message comes from a trusted source and pathways are created for us, like that bike lane is created, then I can be inspired to do that, to get on my bike and to test out that bike lane. So it's it's recognizing that as a local government, we can create the pathways uh, and then inspire folks through storytelling to to take us up on it and get to that behavior change. So that is our overview of the storytelling framework. I know we're taking questions at the end, so if you have them, you can jot them down. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Sarah to um, talk a little bit about Nashua's experience kind of going through this process. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I know we're waiting for the slide to change. I have faith it will. 
Um, so my name is Sarah Marshaw. Uh, I am the Community Development Division Director for the City of Nashua, and I'm also the President of the Northern New England Chapter of the American Planning Association, sponsor for today's session. Um, so a little bit about our experience. Um, for those of you who don't know Nashua or New Hampshire very well, we are the um, second largest city in New Hampshire, a whole 90,000 people. Um, and we are in the southernmost portion of the state. We're actually part of the Boston metro area. Um, New Hampshire is a very unique tax base, which feeds into a couple things um, that, uh, there we go, um, which feeds into a couple ways that we operate. Um, we have no sales tax and no income tax. So essentially, um, our government system is funded through property taxes alone. Also, because of our location um, being on the southernmost border of the state, all of our surrounding states have sales tax. So we actually have a pretty large retail. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you see the, um, the high number of retail lead certified buildings. Um, our retail industry is extremely strong. Um, New Hampshire is also one of the oldest states in the nation. We're the third oldest state behind Maine, I think, and Vermont. So um, we are working very hard to um, attract and retain our younger people. Um, and at the same time, we are one of the best places to live in America. The city of Nashua has been named twice a best place, a best city to live in. Um, and six, we were just re-ranked again in the top 20 uh, last year. We have um, been ranked at the top of all um, fiscal responsibility cities. And so we have a lot of great things going for us. We're also just two hours to the lakes region, an hour to the ocean. Um, so it really is a wonderful place to live, but we have a lot of things to work on, just like any other community. So our main challenge, um, we started this project as a planner here with limited resources and um, no sustainability officer and a, a new mayor coming in who we'll meet a little bit later in this presentation. But all the work we're doing in this city, we're doing a lot of great things. And unfortunately, the things that dominate the newspaper are stories of lawsuits and budget woes that everybody else has, right? Um, things that are not as positive about it. And so in coming into this, there's a lot of people who are coming to me and making suggestions and saying, why doesn't the city do this? You know, beating the drum on this or that. And I was surprised by how many of them we actually are doing something about. But we didn't. We don't have a good way to get our information out there, and we don't have a good way to use data to explain our information, which I think is the really, really critical piece. Because um, as Kim has been talking about, the story has its value. That's what has staying power, and that's what makes somebody tell their neighbor or their friend who they're having dinner with tonight about something good and helps to really spread the word. So Nash is doing a, many great things. Um, one of them is um, investing in renewable energy. In the past couple of years, we've actually um, bought a second hydroelectric dam. And so we own two hydroelectric facilities in the city. They're both run of river. And we generate enough green electricity every year to power on average 365 houses or to cover um, half all of the city's electrical usage. You know, that's a really good story. Um, we have some of the, we have the highest energy rates in the nation in New Hampshire and New England. Um, and so, you know, we have all these businesses who are talking to us about what are you doing to help us reduce energy costs. And this is actually something we can use as an economic development tool as well, because we can be our own kind of third party supplier. So there's a lot of things we're doing, but again, getting the word out. How do we tell our story so that the community really knows better? And through this process, we started doing that. Improving water quality as well. Um, I started a process of a riverfront downtown redevelopment plan a couple of years ago. And um, the first thing I heard from the community was, well, why would we invest in our, in our riverfront? We don't want people down there, the river's polluted. Well, the river was polluted 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but incredible investments have been made and you can eat the fish now. And people were like, no, you can't, definitely not but you can and so through this website through telling our story through kim helping us to kind of pull our data and making that telling it in a way that is a story we've been able to really change that conversation and therefore getting people to want to invest in our new riverfront plan and saying hey why aren't we capitalizing on our riverfront you've really seen the change in that one of the examples here is um in the in just a couple of years the city has reduced um 
sewer discharge into the Nashua Merrimack River by almost 90%. I mean, that's a massive amount of sewer overflow that's no longer going into our water bodies, into our two main rivers, and has really made a, a huge positive effect um, through an investment that the taxpayers made through millions of dollars. Um, you can change that, Kim. So we've also been protecting our natural resources. Um, the city has, you know, talking to taxpayers about the positive benefits of the of the money that they're spending and that they've approved, the city has um, over 1,200 acres um, of conserved lands and miles of trails were recently added. Um, we're also working on um, ongoing projects to connect the, the core of our downtown to a pretty amazing park area that we have um, and looking at all modes of transportation. So complete streets, um, we started working a couple years ago um, with help from APA and um, the original grant from the CDC about um, really looking at complete streets policy and infrastructure because we had nothing nothing on, on the books about that. Um, and our Department of Public Works has come um, has literally switched 180 degrees in the past couple years on this. Um, and so we have some really interesting complete streets infrastructure that's been added. And even just recently this year with the mayor and um, his efforts to try and really help green the city and uh, be a city for all people, um, we just added a dockless bike share system with VO Ride. And one of the coolest things besides the fact that there's these awesome blue bikes everywhere that people are riding is that we get all the data from that, from where everybody rides, where they ride to and from and how long. And with that, we've been able to work with DPW and now we have scheduled um, new bike lanes to be installed exactly where people are riding the most. And we're putting up bike racks in those areas. So it's kind of chicken and egg, but we don't have anybody responsible. We don't have enough people to say, okay, your job is to do this, your job is to do this. So part of community development and I think planning and as planners and our want to make better communities and to champion those ideas is it's really helpful when I have data that says people are riding their bikes here. You keep telling me nobody's riding your bike on Main Street. We don't need bike land on Main Street. Now I have data that says we absolutely are. And the dockless bike system costs the city zero dollars. There's no input out front. So that kind of data is just hugely valuable. Um, and actually, we've been reporting our um, we've been reporting the data out to the community not only in like bike rides and riders, but also in greenhouse gas emissions saved um, for all the miles that have been ridden. We translate that into the into the greenhouse gas emissions saved, which is a cool statistic and helps people think a little bit more about that. Um, we've also done some huge energy consumption um, reductions. So we did all of our streetlights to an LED conversion. The first full year of that was last year, 2018. Um, our electric bill in the city for streetlights alone in 2016 was $816,000. And as of 2018, it was $460,000. So we cut our streetlight electric bill almost in half. So we can tell that story, but here comes our call to action, right? So we have as of this spring, we started a Solarize Plus campaign where the city, again, a no-cost option, um, did an RFP, and we vetted both a solar installer and a, um, a, a professionals at winterization and um, reducing energy usage in your home. And so we brought these two, we, we found the best we could, and um, we're using kind of a group purchasing model that um, anybody in Nashua and actually some of our surrounding communities too, who signed up through this program can come get an, um, an energy audit of their house, um, a winterizing um, overview of improvements they can make and solar. And the more people who sign up, the less the, the greater the reduction um, in the cost to you. And so we have this campaign going on right now, Solarize Plus, and you can actually find it off of the Livable Nashua dashboard. Um, and we are seeing really, we're seeing a great amount of interest. We're seeing people, it's relatively new. So we have seen um, a good amount of signups for about a third of a way to our goal, but we can say, you know, the city's made this investment. We see the benefits. We're seeing a huge reduction in our energy bills. This makes sense. What do you think about trying to either reduce your energy footprint or to see if you can help us with some green energy production? And we also streamlined all our permitting processes for that. 
So this is the mayor. Uh, mayor Donchez started in 2016. Um, he was the first mayor in New Hampshire to support the Paris Climate Accord, um, and he's part of the Mayor's Climate Accord. He also, um, through this process and trying to help tell the story of data, um, we just invested in our first greenhouse gas inventory in um, almost 10 years um, because we really need to know where we are so that as we're talking about these projects and telling our stories, we can say this is where we are and we need to set reasonable goals going forward. So what might those be? Um, also, just this week, we joined in with 19 other cities led by Boston um, to be the first um, to be part of a request for information um, for that went out to um, get feedback from qualified renewable energy project developers with projects that can support the municipal energy demand of 20 cities included in the request. Um, this includes nearly 5.7 terawatt hours of energy. Um, so this should be a really interesting project too that we can see if we can really find other ways to offset our energy with green energy that again costs the city no dollars because I know we're all set for cash. Um, and by partnering with Boston or with other cities who do have more staff than us and more resources, we're not putting it all on us. Next slide. So our goals in doing this Livable Nashua dashboard really were first to educate people about what we are doing. We heard so many stories about, well, why don't why aren't you doing this? And the school's renovating, isn't it? Why doesn't it do this energy? Why doesn't it increase its, uh, reduce its energy footprint? And our school system um, does that automatically. They do a great job of that. And through this dashboard, we can show the savings that have been achieved by each renovation and by making that a priority. But we haven't been good about communicating it. Um, so we can also then look to set goals for our future. And we want to document this all based on real data. Um, there's a lot of great speculation. There's a lot of people who say, well, I know that this is what's happening in the community, or this is what I see. But backing that up with real data makes a huge difference. Um, and then aligning the city program to support those goals. Um, the mayor created a new energy and environment committee, and they are solely working forward on helping to define some goals, but also to advocate for that city programming to support those. And then maintain engagement. The people who show up and who want to do something and participate and be part of this, we want to give them something to do. So our Solarize campaign is being run by amazing volunteers who are literally going door to door and knocking and talking to people about this program. Um, and so we found them through this Livable Nashua dashboard and for kind of putting out calls through Facebook and other things. Um, and it's really amazing as we've embarked on this process, how many people who have interest and are actually willing to step up and take the time to volunteer have popped up, Who people who haven't been engaged with us before. So speaking of the Energy and Environment Committee, this was a committee created in 2016-17 uh, um, that really got going and they just um, created their first set of recommendations that were presented to the Board of Aldermen, and they haven't been officially adopted by the city yet, but um, they are in the process of, they're under discussion, and they set some pretty some pretty big goals for the city. Um, they don't necessarily, as I said, have the power to um, align city budget with them, but they have a good, strong voice, and they will stand up and advocate for things, and they're being really supported because it is it is a pretty grassroots effort. So we really wanted to focus on a couple different ways, um, things the city can do, like reducing its own municipal vehicle emissions, but also looking at things that we can encourage the public to do too. Oh, so how did we create our Livable Nashua dashboard? I um, am not gonna lie, I'm a busy person, I'm sure all of you are too, and I really wanted to do this, but I didn't want to make this a massive project that would end up butting heads with my other division directors or asking too much at once from anybody. Um, first embarking on this idea, uh, it wasn't any, it was a cell that took a little bit of work and I wanted to get some early wins, um, low hanging fruit. So we started with focus areas that I knew the data was readily available and that we could get. Um, so we looked at the built environment. We looked at what data the finance division was already collecting and tracking. And we looked at things that were within community development that I had data on and could produce. Um, and we took this data, Kim gave us these awesome spreadsheets, 
um, pretty simple spreadsheets. You fill this in and then um, a little worksheet. And when we put this data together and filled out the worksheet, it, it isn't in my nature to be super creative or to understand how I get a spreadsheet of data into a great story for the community. But with working with KLA, their ability to ask good questions and to kind of flush out what these different statistics mean and how we could be talking to the community about them, we were really able to create some great stories um, that have been used pretty widely at this point into the community. So we used all this data, we broke it all down and turned it into a dashboard. Um, and getting ready to launch the dashboard, there was a, um, there were, we wanted it to be visual, we wanted it to have um, all the different aspects of the storytelling that Kim talked about. And we wanted to make sure that a lot of people knew about it initially. So we reached out to everybody under the sun, just like we would um, in kicking off a, a master planning process or a major project um, from community groups to the news media, to citizens, to all of our, our regional planning partners, our NPO, um, and kind of tried to talk to everybody about that this was coming. And Mayor, on a whim, was awesome and um, I gave, in under 20 minutes did this video that we could launch through our YouTube channel, play on all our social media sites and put on the front page of our city's website. So it's a little bit dated now, but um, it was a great intro and it, we did it on an iPhone and it literally took less than 20 minutes. I don't know if it'll play. I'm not sure if the audio is going to go through, but let me know if you guys can hear it. Do you Maybe hear not. it? No. So you can check it about from our website. <laughs> but basically, the mayor is promoting the idea of the website, of the dashboard, and how it works, and really walking people through it in a really simple one minute long video. Um, what you can see in this video is that it's set up in tile, and I think the beauty of that is that it really works as far as I didn't want to create a website that got stale easily or that we couldn't update the data on, and the website is made to go very easily to your phone and a mobile device. So when you're looking at it on a mobile device, it's the top three tiles that you'd see probably. And so the website's set up in a way that even though we pull all this data together, we generally update it once a year. And it's one spreadsheet that we fill out to update. And then it's easy to switch the order of the tiles on the website. And when you switch the order of the bottom three tile, or the bottom of the 12 tiles to the top, those top three, then it looks like it's new information in many ways. And it's it helps to keep it refreshed without putting in a lot of effort and worried about, um, having things being out of date. So the other thing that we did as part of the launch, moving on from the video, is um, a really concerted public engagement effort. So we set up um, a booth in the City Hall Rotunda, which is where everybody who has to register their cars um, at the beginning and end of the month um, stands in long lines and is bored and has nothing to do. Um, and so we had surveys there about what's important to you, what kind of data are you looking for? Um, and you could win a free tablet, thanks um, to KLA. Um, that was something that I hadn't done before in city government. We don't spend money on prizes very well to get people to fill out surveys. And it was amazing the difference it made. Um, we got a lot of great feedback. We sent out citywide emails. Um, the City Academy is a, is a training process that the city sets up with 50 individual volunteers every year to teach them about how city government works. We do it each spring, and so um, we talk to them. We have all our Facebook pages, and we sent it out to all the committees in the city. It's amazing how many people volunteer within any given city, you know, not just the land use boards, but um, I, I think we have 42 committees that I asked for the list of the committees and emailed this information to. So when you just look internal to the city itself, it's amazing how many people and contact information you have. Um, and what we learned from our survey, uh, we wanted the dashboard to reflect what people actually wanted. And uh, one thing that we didn't have on there initially that is a huge issue and came up really fast is that housing availability and affordability 
is a really big issue for the community and they wanted data about that and they wanted to help tell that story um, which has really nicely dubbed into tail into the, a lot of that efforts we're putting into housing right now and um, just for an APA plug you should check out their planning for home um, information as that seems to be a problem across the country um, the data that we were presenting is entirely new everybody said I had no idea the city was doing these things and people were very appreciative of that information um, so since then we've added you know what we hear back on the surveys that people want to hear story stories that are important or um, if they had additional questions we've been able to kind of clarify information to add to it um, as we're getting new solar installations all over the city we're updating some information on that and we've seen other divisions um, within the city or departments wanting to get involved and say you know what uh, can we get some of our information out there I like that this is a positive thing to actually talk about some of the good things we're doing um, in the year since we're on year number two we set up another collection of data um, I went to the little bit more I'm going to say difficult this data that wasn't as readily available to me but once we had some wins under the belt it was easier to go to these other division directors and um, other people and say you know what it's a great program see the results that we've had we've seen some progress um, do you have data that is there a story that you want to tell do you have data that you think would support stories and um, was able to pass off these kind of spreadsheets and work with a lot of them to get um, to get this information up on our website and it it's been a really positive feedback mechanism and even just to know what everybody else is working on it's really hard to keep up with everything um, it's been a really it's been a really positive thing and it's helped us to work together better on a bunch of different projects so um, as I talked about earlier keeping the website fresh we um, every time we're adding a new tab or a new box on the website um, we do a new media push we have um, some great community news articles that are coming out we have um, regular social media posts that back up kind of one of the tiles or one of the themes each month um, we move the top tiles up and shift things around so even though we don't have new data we're kind of rotating through the information we already have to highlight it and we just update it once a year after annual reports when all the data is being gathered anyways um, and through the Energy and Environment Committee, we really have a great group of volunteers who's kind of helping us to develop more baseline data with the greenhouse gas emissions and then really kind of pushing the idea of goal setting um, and going back and forth with our community to make sure that the ideas we're talking about, the goals we're talking about are um, in line with what their, their expectations are and having those good conversations telling those stories. So I think that's all. There's me. And next is Kim and uh, happy to answer questions. I was just gonna say, Sarah and Christine, because we have a little bit of extra time, I wasn't able to exit the PowerPoint before, but um, I can now, and if you want, I can just throw up the um, site quick, Sarah, if you just wanna show people the tiles. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Let me know when you see it. I see it. So this is our main page. Um, and you'll see here um, as you scroll down and if it's on your phone it's 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 a little bit easier to see but we have um, all local news stories just kind of automatically feed into it so I don't have to do it because <laughs> I don't have time um, so we have a lot of local news that's just kind of feeding in and also making it look updated without us necessarily having to do a lot of things um, and we have specific um, articles about um, what we're, about some recent news stories in Nashville that we can highlight on, without the rotating basis. So we have divided our dashboard up into initiatives, but also just the categories. Um, you can click on, you can do it through this bar at the top or click on any of the tiles. Um, and so I don't know if there's one you really want to click on, but this is Public Health, one of our partners that came on a little bit later. Um, the time to talk about some of our, um, our concerns with obesity um, and overweight adults um, public health has pretty amazing programs that they've been working with the community on and so you can see here that they have their baseline data but they've also set goals through their chip their community health improvement program that they are mandated to do every three years so they already had a lot of the data and they had already done the public outreach for a goal and so we're talking about it in a couple different ways that you can see where we have been and what we're trying to get to um, 
And so it, all the data is displayed in several different ways so people can easily understand it. And you can view sources there. Um, we always have those people who call and say, well, where did you get this data from? And you can just click, they can click right there if they really want to view our sources here, it's on every page. Um, and then here it goes telling the story about where do we, where are we, what does this mean? Um, are we are we doing better than the rest of the region um, or even New Hampshire or um, where are we in that line and, and where does our goal sit within that line? And um, what you can do, um, here's your call to action that's on each page. Um, and here's the, the main item that public health is promoting. Um, and some of these you'll see also um, access to other information, uh, relevant sites. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that's set up in all the different tiles. And you can check it out on your phones as we're going through this. Um, but it is, it, there's a lot of information here. It's a different way to see it. And it's also really easy when I'm out and about or the public health director, Bob Lee Bagley, you know, when she's out and about and talking to people or talking about this initiative, she can say, you know, check out the Livable Nashua dashboard. Instead of saying, going to my, check out my chip and, you know, chapter six of the chip has this information in it. This is a really easy way to get um, information out and to be able to refer back to it quickly to people. I also had business cards made. We did this for our Riverfront downtown plan and decided to do it here. Um, I actually have business cards that are for the Livable Nashua dashboard. Um, and it just has the website and has a little bit about it. And having a business card to hand out about something like this makes it really easy to point people to the website and to the data that they're looking for. Um, and that's been, that's been really helpful. And here's some of our initiatives. Um, climate change, our renewable energy, and Resilient Nashua is a program the Emergency Management Director has been working on. Um, and so we're using this website to kind of house a whole bunch of different things. So I'm looking to help us define some goals here as well. Um, we talked about hydro. We do a ton of um, methane collection. And um, this is another one that people said, you know, why don't we, why don't we do anything with that landfill? Well, we are, <laughs> but people didn't, just don't really know about it. Yeah, and I would say that's often the case, right? Um, a lot of the public work stuff, especially, they're just doing this stuff. It's best practices and public work struggles just as much, if not sometimes more, I think, than the planners in trying to get out the, the good stories that they're engaged with. So that was a great partnership that Sarah was able to connect with Public Works on this. So I think that's, that's it for now. Okay. Christine, do you um, want to facilitate the Q&A? Yes, sorry, my mute function was not working correctly. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Oh, good. You can yes. hear me. Okay. So first question, um, and uh, quite a few of these now are related to this website, but first, um, are the goals on the dashboard the same as the goals of your comprehensive plan or are they different? 